Hello, welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for January the 26th, 2012. I'm John Hofel, and with me in the studio today are Ben Denniston from the basement, Sky Shields from the basement, and Lyndon LaRouche. So good morning, Lynn. Good morning. Well, this is going to be a very unusual experience for most people viewing this business because there is a scientific principle of great importance involved in this whole program. And that will become clear at the close of the presentations, first by him and then right then here. And at the end of that, they will do the, each make their presentation in sequence with the audiovisual material available. And then they will discuss the things among themselves. And then we will close it out with me and them. And then you will take over. So, uh, this is going to be an unusual experience for the audiences uh, as well as in other people because of my associates on flanking me on either side have put together a piece which is of remarkable significance, not only historic significance but of scientific significance. And the best way to go with this is to follow what they have to say in sequence, starting with Sky and then Ben, and then they will discuss it across what they've done and can comment on it, and then I will enter with a happy remarks on what they have accomplished to close it out, and then we'll give it back to you. So, okay. So, we'll do a picture. I mean, we've got a chance right now. We want to tackle, uh, as you said, a question of, of core economic scientific principle. It's we're going to take a look at what. This is an image that I think people will find people will find on our website currently, which is meant to be to work, operate as a heuristic device for some of the key principles which you've been addressing in your recent papers. Now we're going to do a what we'll what we'll discuss here will be a very specific case study, actually a set of case studies. It won't be a substitute for a full read of everything you laid out, but I think it'll give a good guide to the to the to the meat to the core of the matter. What we're going to look at is we're going to address a couple of things. One is what's come up a lot recently, which is the texture of economic time. But then we're going to get at what the ontology of this is. What exactly is the ontology of these key, of key developmental processes that are shared in common between overall human development, economic development, and the creative anti-entropic development of the universe as a whole. Now we'll, we'll draw some key distinctions at the end between the biospheric processes and then human processes. But first we're going to take a look at certain characteristics that are in common because the, these are going to be characteristics that will be of characteristics of anti-entropic development, of evolutionary development as a whole that are actually inviolable in contrast mm -hmm. to the standard description of what evolutionary development is. And we'll see that uh, the processes we'll look at here both within the biosphere and within human economies are going to be completely opposed to everything laid out by the, the Darwinian program of natural selection, everything laid out by Adam Smith for economic policy. But then on a more fundamental level of ontology, it will be entirely opposed to the whole program put together by Pierre Simon Laplace. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a look here. Uh, in taking a look at, in examining the, the development of life in the biosphere, we see that it's punctuated by certain key events. The uh, overall trend is a certain development that we know culminates with where we now find ourselves now, with uh, human beings playing a very specific role within the biosphere and within the universe as a whole. But along that route, you see, a, you see certain key steps of development that have to be reached to get us to where we are. Now, those are that, that overall upward development, anti-entropic development, is punctuated by events that are typically referred to as mass extinction events. And the two we're going to take a look at today to focus in on, even though these aren't the only two, are known as the KT mass extinction and the PT mass extinction. The Cretaceous tertiary is the KT and the Permian Triassic is the PT. Now, hopefully I think by the time we're done here, it will be clear that these, what's most significant about these events is not that they are extinction events. In fact, we might see that that's going to be a, uh, an improper use of a of term. Mm -hmm. These are actually certain key qualitative types of transition. 
which are marked as much by the creation of new species as by the elimination of new species. And in fact, we'll see that the reason for the elimination of these species is that overall process of creation. What governs the need for the disappearance of certain, of certain, of, uh, certain systems on the planet is what's required for the production of the new, of the new subsequent system. So we'll take a look at, uh, just so people have an idea, this, the KT extinction event is what I think people have in their minds already in the popular culture as the extinction of the dinosaurs. People know this as this is when the dinosaurs vanished. Uh, most people don't really take into account that this is also when you get the creation of what we recognize as our modern system. Certain key elements that we take for granted in our modern system mm -hmm. emerged post that boundary. This is the development of mammalian life, the, the rise of the birds, the, the rise of flowering plants, fruiting plants, all the things that we recognize. As you said, the, you know, the birds, the bees, the mammals, the fruits, and the nuts. These are mm -hmm. all emerged immediately after the, after the KT. Now the question is, well, what is the texture of, 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 of anti-entropic development and anti-entropic time that governs that process? Mm -hmm. And we'll see that it's a reflection of one very key economic principle, which is the increase of energy flux density. Now we're going to examine that here so we can see as a, we can take that, that continuous process as something we want to carry over now to policy making in the present to get us out of the current crisis. Mm -hmm. Now this discussion is going to be the discussion that we're going to want to bring right now into the economics departments that you're going to want to make dominant in, on the planet because we're witnessing the failure. Currently, globally, you're witnessing the failure of everything that's been proposed as economics over the last several decades. Mm -hmm. And anybody right now, I think you've got people who are realizing that they've been sold a real, you know, that they've been sold sort of, I can say, a lemon. Mm -hmm. with their, uh, what's been promised to them is economics education and scientific education. And they're, we're in a position right now where we really do need a renaissance. We need a revival of this earlier approach and a reapplication of it if we're even going to survive. Mm -hmm. So I guess to begin with, I could, I'll pass it off to you, Ben, to begin to take a look at the sort of what characterizes this distinction across these two major boundaries. Mm -hmm. And the key thing in approaching this is to get, like you're saying, get away from this Laplacian causality, get to the actual principle of what's the real cause of the substance of this development mm -hmm. process. And the first step is just to immediately state outright that you're looking at the development of the biosphere system as a whole. We're looking at the question is what, what's actually governing that process, like you're saying. And so in taking this half billion years, the last 540 million years about of the development of complex life, something we have a decent record of in the fossils, um, these two mass extinctions really stand out as clear inflection points in the development of that whole system as a single system. And <coughs> To put the first point out, to, to, to get into it, the, the first principle you see throughout this whole process is the, the energy of the entire system is constantly increasing. Mm -hmm. and you, in, but it's not just a gradual growth process. You get these stark inflection points where you move to a, a new state of the system. Mm -hmm. And like you've discussed in previous presentations here, the locations on the website, uh, the way this occurs in the biosphere is you'll have the beginning of the introduction of a new system within the prior system. Mm -hmm. And you'll have the beginning of it and then at a certain point you'll get the actual takeover of this new system taking over the first system. And so we have that illustrated in this series of nested cones expressing this process. Now what you have first for the biosphere, just to make it clear to get familiar yeah. with it, uh, really your baseline just total energy of the system, and we'll get into more, some more qualitative metrics shortly, but the, the, the baseline, the energy of the whole system is defined by your photosynthetic activity. That, that's, that's, your, that's the way life, organic matter, can actually take energy from the sun, sunlight, and actually transform into something that life can use. So that becomes kind of your bottom line of everything. You know, everything that goes on with life is ultimately dependent upon this photosynthesis process. And so if you look at a global map, you can see NASA's put these out, different agencies. You can see the distribution of where photosynthetic activity actually occurs in the planet. And you'll see that even today, there are huge regions where 
there's hardly any activity at all. Mm -hmm. You have great deserts. Uh, we're familiar with the Great American Desert, mm -hmm. which were actually uh, something the WAPA would address and actually upshifting and developing. Um, you have the major uh, Sahara de Desert in Africa, and then also if you see in the oceans, you have huge desert regions in the oceans. Mm -hmm. So there's already limited areas where you even have life active, productive, right. and actually creating new, uh, new biological matter, the baseline of the whole biosphere system. And that's significant drawing out. I think people don't really recognize that the open ocean is largely, with respect to this sort of, this process, yeah. photosy so photosynthesis, as far as the development of life as a whole, that these mm -hmm. do function as desert regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is function, yeah, it's exactly, it is desert. And there's certain life maybe deep down, certain vents and different things, mm -hmm. but for the vast majority, it's, most of life is in the regions that are indicated here. Um, but what you see is this process has gone through clear qualitative upshifts, both in, on land and in the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, corresponding to these phase shifts of the biosphere system. Uh, just to highlight some of the key uh, developments, you had the whole of the first around 300, roughly 300 million years of this process in what's called the Paleozoic era. Uh, the dominant form of plant life on land was, after it emerged on land partly through this process, but the dominant form of plant life on land that characterized the latter part of this period was more of a fern-based life, which was characterized by needing to be near water to reproduce it had spores. It didn't have standard seeds like you see today. Mm -hmm. So the, even the plant life that could be on land was limited very much to these uh, coastal regions. Mm -hmm. Then you had a huge breakthrough with the, um, around the PT mass extinction. Like you're saying, it was a mass extinction. It was devastating. You had 96% of species eliminated from the planet, roughly. Um, but what came out of it was the development in this photosynthetic base with the totally new quality of plant life with the gymnosperms. So now you had the seed-based life, and what that enabled was life was able to penetrate much deeper into the inland of the continents than it could otherwise. It could actually move into dry air, drier areas. It didn't require to be immediately in a wet or moist environment to reproduce, which was the case with the um, previous system. And then you saw a further upshift in the plant life on land uh, associated with the KT mass extinction, we had the development of the angiosperms. And we'll get into a little bit more of the significance of that also, but then you had a further spreading of life. Mm -hmm. But then what gets interesting is that this is where you really have to get away from the bad pairwise causality that dominates everything. Because you're looking at it as the whole system's driving towards this upshift. Because you see this exact same upshift, not just on land, but you see it in the oceans as well. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in the, for the photosynthesis in the oceans, uh, the majority of it is done actually by what are called phytoplankton, little single-celled critters. They actually produce the vast majority of photosynthetic activity, the creation of new living matter in the oceans is by these little single-celled guys. And you see the exact same set of three qualitative shifts that you see with plant life on land, you see with plant life in the oceans too, mm -hmm. around the... Um, the PT mass extinction, 250 million years ago, you have a qualitative shift mm -hmm. in the type of pho photosynthetic life in the oceans. And with this, you have uh, life, photosynthetic life spreading uh, further, deeper into the oceans, mm -hmm. overall more production, more creation of new biological matter. And then you get a similar shift with the, uh, the, KT, the, senes, the, the KT mass extinction. Mm -hmm. And... One way to indicate this, for example, it's, there's a lot of ways to get a sense of how the whole uh, total energy of the systems increase. But for example, one metric that comes up is you can look at between these three systems, you can compare how many species of uh, higher life are supported per single species of uh, photosynthetic life mm -hmm. in the oceans. And so you see the steady increase from about five species to 10 species to 60 species mm -hmm. going from system to system. So you're seeing that with this increase of the photosynthetic base, you get an increase to support a, a higher and, as we'll see, more complex and more advanced whole system of life mm -hmm. based on this uh, advance in the photosynthetic base and the energy of the system. Um, but this is not just simply a linear increase. 
this actually uh, expresses, like you opened up with, it, it gets you more to this closer to this question of energy flux density of the system. It actually get more to the principle of what's governing this developing upshifting process, what's actually governing this anti-entropic process as we see it. And you can see that it expressed as you have the shifts, so the whole energy of the system's increasing. And you made the point earlier that this, this, this did become, this also become crucial in any, under, any discussion of a real healthy economic process. But the whole energy of the system is constantly increasing, going through these upshifts. Mm -hmm. You're also getting a constant increase in the uh, consumption. Right. The energy consumption uh, per capita and here per species is constantly increasing with right. these processes. We should underscore that. I mean, it's what mm -hmm. you're saying, but that that and we'll we'll get this will become more clear as we take it into the economic discussion. But this is the exact opposite of everything yeah. that's ever argued by the environmentalists. Right. It's the opposite of what's argued by all of these the so-called uh, uh, these sort of household economics, free trade economics, like mm -hmm. Gingrich and these and these people, right. who say that the way you try and that you find your profit margin in cutting back and reducing mm -hmm. consumption. Yeah, right. This is never the case anywhere in the history of the biosphere. Mm -hmm. The actual the actual source of the development is the increase of consumption, exactly. but being able to balance out in the processes that, we, that you're describing here. You mm -hmm. balance it out by by the quality of upshift that you launch. Right. And as we'll come to that doing the opposite is going to guarantee that's the only way to, that's the way to absolutely guarantee extinction. Mm -hmm. As we'll see in these cases here. To, to not go with this process, try to limit yourself to any fixed state in the system, is that's that's the definition of guaranteeing extinction. Because there's there's no fixed point in this process. The whole process is moving forward. Um, we'll get to a couple cases of that shortly. But uh, another clear expression of these upshifts in these systems, you can see it just in the question of the metabolic rate, the metabolism of different species, um, and the. You know, fun way to pose is you could actually, if you actually take the different living, the different uh, flesh of different creatures, like one gram of flesh of a mouse versus a lizard versus a salamander, for example, the actual amount of constant intake of food and water and oxygen and respiration required to sustain that same one ounce of flesh mm -hmm. is completely qualitatively different by each of these uh, different types of species. And that, that's what you see, these creatures we have, these are kind of reflections of the type of species you had in these previous eras, mm -hmm. right? You obviously had the introduction of mammals as becoming the dominant system following the KT mass extinction. Mm -hmm. the, rep, the reptiles dominated uh, following the PT mass extinction. Mm -hmm. But what you see is that the, the metabolic rates shifting, increasing through this process is a very clear expression of the the clear characteristic of a constant increase in energy consumption mm -hmm. per species, but then really it is a pretty direct expression, this question of the energy flux density. Mm -hmm. like the actual uh, flux of, uh, through respiration, eating again, everything that's required to sustain the organisms is required to be at a faster rate mm -hmm. with these upshifts in these systems. Um, and what you can see is that here we have just one example, but I mean this is this is just one illustration of the principle of the process. What you see with these upshifts then is that these mass extinctions, what they really signify is that then the species that can't, that don't upshift with the system, that are fixed mm -hmm. to the lower level of system, the the previous order are the ones that go extinct. Mm -hmm. I mean this is a, a fun single example, but I think it reflects a lot, which is uh, this case of the comparison of these brachiopods versus these bivalve mollusks. Image and, six. Mm -hmm. hmm? Image six. Yeah, yeah right. And the, the mollusks are the one you have, uh, it's your clams, oysters, everything we're familiar with today. There was a very similar creature that dominated uh, the whole Paleozoic era mm -hmm. called these uh, brachiopods. They, similar two-shelled creature, lived in similar locations, ate similar food, had similar predators. They occupied a similar place in the relative system, mm -hmm. um, but at, you, as you see at the, the PT mass extinction, the brachiopods were devastated. They were wiped out. Mm -hmm. The mollusks were hardly affected. They were affected, but nowhere near as bad as the brachiopods. Mm -hmm. And the mollusks then took over and became the dominant species. Mm -hmm. Well, the mollusks have a metabolic rate roughly on the order of 10 times 
that of the brachiopods. So it's a very clear, it's one case, but you see it also with the dinosaurs, comparing the dinosaurs to the mammals. Mm -hmm. You see that it's, it's the, the whole system's moving towards, like you're saying, a constant requirement for further uh, uh, energy consumption per, per species. And that characterizes the system. I mean, and this is, again, across the board, we're kind of pulling out slices here, but one fun thing we came across is that also even, even the development of, uh, of fungi shows this, of all things, mm -hmm. that actually in the whole Paleozoic period, you actually had uh, very primitive fungi that couldn't really break down uh, tree matter and different living plant matter very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And only, they only came in following the successive uh, shifts of the system, but then what's the significance of that? Well, it was a great increase in the actual, the so-called carbon cycle and the so-called oxygen cycle, because now you had this increased fungal form that could then actually break down the material at a faster rate and increase the flow of the, the exchange of the um, carbon from living to non-living back into living again, same with the oxygen. So there's something you see across the board, we're just pulling out a couple, mm -hmm. you know, illustrative examples here. And that's going to um, be a theme that's going to keep coming up, that speed of the cycling. Yeah, exactly. That things will actually increase the speed of it. It's mm -hmm. something that it's an innovation to be able to speed up decay mm -hmm. is an innovation. Because mm -hmm. you see not, it's not simply, and again, this is where the language sort of trips us up because you, you know, people right. think of decay as a collapse. In this case, it's not. It's speeding up the ability to do what Vladimir Vernadsky referred to as the biogenic migration of atoms. Mm -hmm. Which is if you, and I, we'll get into, yeah. if you view yeah. these elements as these the individual creatures as singularities, mm -hmm. what you're speeding up is the amount of flow of the whole system through these right. things that are just singular, singular elements. Mm -hmm. You get an increased, an increased rate at which life itself transforms the face of the planet, mm -hmm. transforms the atmosphere, transforms the, the soils, transforms the oceans. That throughout this process, life's expanded, it's taken up more of the earth to transform, to, to take in and change the characteristics mm -hmm. of it. And it's done, like you're saying, at a faster rate, a constantly faster rate. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the point is that then this, this, this whole environmentalist doctrine, and like you're saying, everything that governs economics today then has to be seen from this standpoint. Because any idea that you're going to, and it becomes, uh, it becomes more and more necessary to get to this issue, this becomes a practical issue at the point of this, this, this deep of a crisis right now. Because the crisis reflects that we've gone so far. The reason why the crisis is so bad is because we've gone so far from a system that actually is principled, that actually corresponds with what we know about the way the universe actually works. And so it necessitates that we actually get more to the fundamentals of what, what is mankind actually facing now as a crisis to actually determine what kind of policies we need to, to get out of this crisis. And it can never happen if we just try and repair the system that we have now. Mm -hmm. It's going to require this type of, I mean, we can do a lot more. We, we have plans to do more studies of this, looking at this, this type of staged development process in human economics throughout the history of human society. Mm -hmm. um, and looking also at cases like we were discussing earlier, the Roman Empire, where you have a case where if a society that doesn't make that leap, then is destined to collapse, destined to a dark age. So you get the, the both sides of it. Um, but I mean, th this is going to become, this needs to become the, the, the baseline for discussing what type of policy we need immediately. That's going to be the only policy that, that's, act that's actually going to work to move us out of this crisis. So I think you wanted to, to get into it a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, I'll discuss. I mean, I'll just draw out a couple of the elements from this. I mean, take a look at, so, yeah, so think about what you mentioned on the question of the, of the development of fungal life. So across each of these breaks, you've got a development of fungal life that increases what's known this biogenic migration of atoms. I mean, we mm -hmm. discussed it. If you were to take, if you could put on your, your glasses such that you could only see carbon or such that you could only see, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in this case, say you put on your glasses and all you could see was phosphorus. And you were to take a look at this whole arc of development across these major breaks you'd see a couple of things that are very interesting in, in how phosphorus sort of moves. Now again, at this point, so you no longer see your individual organisms. You see a whole system that looks somewhat continuous, though marked by singularities. There's, around the PT extinction, 
you begin to see something interesting because the PT extinction is very skeleton specific. Mm. And this was something that was very, that sort of remains an anomaly to this day. There's lots of explanations, but the extinction selectively picks out across the board a very a certain type of composition of a skeletal composition. It, it isolates skeletons that are predominantly calcium carbonate skeletons, but then leaves alone, you know, and, and broadly skeletons that are calcium phosphate, like our own. As a result, as you start to see now the predominance of these, of the, uh, the calcium phosphate skeletons, you start to, you look at that shift, you can start to see a, you now say we've got our glasses again, we're only seeing the, the role of phosphorus, suddenly you're seeing an increased migration of phosphorus as a planet. We're taking this as one case study off our periodic table here, mm -hmm. but you'll be able to do this for each of these elements, you'd be able to sort of trace a life history in this way. Mm -hmm. And it will always tend towards this element of increased density of the circulation of it, the amount of it being pumped through any of the singularities. That develops to the whole Mesozoic. At the end of the Mesozoic with the KT extinction, you see something huge. Now this is, again, to, to kind of draw out what we're looking at with the cones here. The way you see the image here is within each of these each of these cones is representing one of these systems, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic in this case. And we could also make the divisions at other locations. Across the KT extinction, when you see the introduction of the system, th this final cone growth here gives you the appearance of the whole system of the, as you said, the angiosperms, the fruiting plants, mm -hmm. mammals, uh, uh, but then birds. Mm -hmm. Now, as a... Uh, we've described in other things on the site, that if you had your, just your little phosphorus glasses on and you looked at birds, you'd see essentially packets of flying phosphorus. If you look at the transition across this boundary, suddenly you'd see chunks of phosphorus flying from continent to continent. And then, you know, what we know as sort of the uh, somewhat inconvenient hmm. byproduct of birds as they fly overhead, you know, sometimes they land on shoulders, land on hats, land on cars. Uh, yeah, if you were to look at those in your phosphorus glasses, you'd see packets of phosphorus, very important for fertilizer, very important for, for plant growth. You'd see that they actually fly dropping phosphorus as they, as they spread in the mm -hmm. form of the bird guano, also bat guano. Uh, the phosphorus that runs, that is washed off of continents into the oceans is actually reabsorbed into ocean life and picked up by sea fowl seabirds and brought back on land. That's one of the major ways this recycles back onto to land again, is by the fact that you've got these birds suddenly feeding in the ocean, flying back onto land, and then you know, dropping their, their excrement on land. Mm -hmm. But again, we're not seeing this as excrement. We're seeing this as, we're seeing this as the, the cycling of, of phosphorus. You see a huge increase across the, this KT boundary. Mm -hmm. Now, there's uh, now another demarcation that we don't have here, but it's significant. We'll show in another image within the Cenozoic. Take a look now. What happens to our vision of the cycling of phosphorus once you get the introduction of human activity? Now, this is something that's interesting. Okay, so we're going to leave out other aspects of human activity for a moment. We're going to look at it just with our phosphorus glasses on. Now, think about what happens when you see suddenly the introduction of uh, you get the agricultural, the green revolution, the real green revolution, not this one, the, mm -hmm. the actual uh, revolution in agriculture, the development of nitrogen fertilizers and these things, mm -hmm. where we suddenly we learned to, instead of just relying on digging up bat guano, bird guano, like we had before in order to, to create our fertilizers, you suddenly now have the development of artificial fertilizers that are rich in nitrates, rich in uh, phosphorus. You see that the level of cy cycling multiply. And this is a big complaint right now. A lot of the environmentalists are targeting specifically that, that you're mm -hmm. seeing the, the increase in cycling of phosphorus. Uh, I think it's like now, <laughs> the figure now is something like four times, several times higher than it was with simply the introduction of birds. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because that, if you take a look at human activity, you start to see this sort of pack sheet development begin to erupt now in a way, and again, you can follow that through each of these elements and you take a look at the cycling, what you have in the whole system. And now that's, that, that's, that's a big deal. And in general, if you were to sort of map that as a continuous curve, you'll see that in general every time with the introduction of human activity. Go back to the, mm -hmm. uh, the image you had here, image three. 
with the development of the plant life across these major boundaries. Mm -hmm. So you take a look at, you know, you have your early ferns, which are capable, you know, incredibly limited compared to the gymnosperms. Right? Gymnosperms will include things uh, like your, uh, uh, your, your pine trees, your non-fruiting your non non plants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your ferns haven't yet developed the pollen. Pollen is a huge innovation over a waterborne uh, sperm, which is what earlier plants use. Earlier plants had to actually release their sperm into water to be near water in order to facilitate the, uh, the, uh, the reproduction among plant life. Suddenly you get a level of isolation. Again, a number of these things we just register as nuisances, but the pollen, which for many of us becomes a nuisance at a certain time of the, of the year, mm -hmm. is actually a very innovation. It's sort of it's your airborne sperm, your ability to now pollinate. Mm -hmm. And across larger distances, but then away from bodies of water, you've got the ability to encapsulate more of that entire system so it's as though you're taking what you once needed to have the river fern system there. Mm -hmm. You're now encapsulating that into a single organism that manages to move that now denser form of technology inland, spread that further. With the seed process specifically? Yes, but with the seeds and then the pollination. Mm -hmm. The ability to have pollination and then with seeds. Mm -hmm. With seeds, you've suddenly got the ability to have something that can be carried long distances. As people know, that you can store seeds and grain for incredible amounts of time. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a huge innovation. They can travel long distances. Once you get fruits, they're capable of traveling long distances inside of other animals. So once you've got the fruit, the bird, the mammalian system, this is a big deal. I mean, again, some of us are personally familiar with the idea that we can, we're very good at carrying things like tomato seeds. Through. They, they somehow manage to survive their whole our whole uh, digestive process without much alteration. But in general, a lot of these seeds will, raspberries, tomatoes, other things you recognize will survive being picked up by animals, carried long distances in their digest digestive tracts and then mm -hmm. dropped further inland, further within water, et cetera. These are, you can see that again as levels of these encapsulation of taking the entire system and embodying it. Mm -hmm. um, our friend, your friend, Kraft Erica, made the point that it's almost as though, if you really start to look at these elements, each of these singularities on land behave as though you almost encapsulate, took the entire ocean, and then they encapsulated it in a sort of a, it's their version of the space station, or their version of a space suit, mm -hmm. where you take the entirety of your ocean, wrap it up in a little, in a sort of a suit, and allow it now to walk onto to land as a self-contained ocean. So all these little systems that used to be separate organisms are now contained in one, and mobile. So you can bring your ocean now on land. Again, we've made the point in some recent videos, that's a huge innovation. This is huge that suddenly you can now take that you no longer have the, the limitation of your jellyfish, et cetera, that's only capable of surviving near the water, that you bring your water with you. Uh, the same thing that happens for animals and plants. Suddenly they develop the idea to have these stiffer stalks where they can actually grow upward on land. This is a huge innovation, mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, ocean life requires the actual requires the the buoyancy of the the, the water to hold it to hold the uh, the plant up. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take a look at that, now take a look at what. So then, from that arc, certain key elements in human development are almost necessary. Certain things that we've done and things we have yet to do, you can start to realize are absolutely necessary. One is the development of greenhouse and other techniques the ability to take that whole system and then again re-encompass re, uh, uh, re that again. So yet again, just like you had earlier this encompassing, we suddenly managed to take entire systems now and govern them as one and close them. This is, well, is what permits us to grow food in, in difficult locations, in desert locations and other things where they wouldn't otherwise survive. We can have these controlled environments. It's what's going to permit us to colonize regions of the earth like the Arctic. And again, mm -hmm. this is a natural part of the development. You get all these silly idiocy claiming, oh, this is unnatural, this is artificial. In fact, this is no more artificial than life moving onto land in the first place. That was mm -hmm. quite artificial. That required some real artifice on the part of plants to decide that you're going to move out of the oceans and live in places where there's no ocean water. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine the audacity to just bring your water with you, that you're going to the audacity, you're going to take all this stuff and just carry it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the same thing in the colonization of these Arctic reasons. But ultimately, we're talking about the same thing in mankind's larger destiny 
in space as a whole, in the galaxy as a whole, that you're talking about carrying the entirety of the system, the, the real mastery of this entire system we have here on Earth is to be found in our amplification of it and then our ability to totally recreate it at a higher level of operation outside of the confines of Earth itself. And we've only seen the very first stabs of this with the things like the sta space station. Mm -hmm. the, the real experiments with this, a real necessary mission is going to be in things like the colonization of establishment of permanent colonies on the moon mm -hmm. and the establishment of permanent colonies on Mars. The overall direction of this is going to agree with the, with the overall with the transformation in energy flux density we've seen in the biosphere as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, take that, we'll take a look at this other image in the second folder here to get the picture of that. Let's open all of these here. Now we'll take a look at, so this becomes, now what I want to compare, we'll discuss comparing these two models. Now you take a look at the, the earlier system that you had of these subsequent cones. Each one of those systems, as it seems to collide with you get the collision at each point of these of these prior systems. Like, let me show them both. So we have the first one here. The first model we saw in biospheric development, punctuated by these mass extinctions, this is has a certain texture to it. Mm -hmm. You have the growth and development of one system that continues to grow, 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 suddenly punctuated by a collapse, at which point it's intersected by a, a system that's meant to succeed it. The system that's meant to succeed it always starts within the existing system. For instance, now if you go back to the, the period of the dinosaurs, you see within the period of the dinosaurs, you get, you'll see, you would see running around these little tiny, certain little tiny elements that would seem to be just extra at that time. You would see running around very small little mammals. You'd see little rodent-like mammals that are running around, small, totally insignificant compared to the overall system of the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. You see repeatedly throughout this whole period, this whole Mesozoic period, the appearance of feathers mm -hmm. and other traits connected to birds, which will appear and then they'll vanish. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because they appear and vanish even without the actual bird being there, without the ability to fly appearing. The feathers will appear and then disappear with no flight develop. It's almost as though they're appearing in anticipation of a system that's yet to be where flight is an essential part of that system. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the, how would you almost say, the, uh, the research and development for that later system during the prior system. And it's built up as the thing that's designed to take over at a collapse point. Now, again, as we discussed, you do see this in elements of human behavior, but it's only it's one type of human behavior that has that same characteristic. And this is mm -hmm. the, the, the psychology of empire always has that characteristic. If you look at the development of, of, of human societies, human empires, you'll see the same sort of thing. And again, we'll discuss it in detail later, but one that I like is look at the development of, of, of Christianity within the Roman Empire. Within the Roman Empire, you've got this thing that's destined towards collapse. But destined for collapse, and even at this early point, it's not like it doesn't take a wrong turn and suddenly end up collapsing. Mm -hmm. By its nature as an empire, it's destined for collapse. Again, just like the dinosaurs, the end of the dinosaurs is not because the dinosaurs did something wrong. It wasn't as though the dinosaurs were doing something good to begin with and then failed at the end. They kept being dinosaurs. They made no fundamental change in their behavior. They continued doing what they sort of were intended to do. Same time, empire, in the course of doing just what it intends to do, will drive itself to collapse. That's inevitable. That's part of the, it's the, act, the fact that it's not, it's lack of development. Mm -hmm. But within it, you'll see the development of these weak forces that actually will represent the next creative shift and you'll see those developing as a ferment. So you'll see the development of republicanism within, within feudalism. You'll see these, these, these willful acts of human creativity that are, will often be reduced to single individuals mm -hmm. within the system, but then they're destined to be the explosion that takes over as the, the next step because of what they represent principally. But with human individuals, you have the potential to not have to wait for those collapses. You've got mm -hmm. the potential not to, not to depend on these extinction events, but instead to say <clears throat> that you can initiate those developments continuously along, along that arc of development. So this gives us the image here, uh, the first zero, zero in the internal folder, of taking a look at this, the, what, would, what would look like, it, 
you get the hyperbolic growth that the other growth seemed to be approximating. Now that's an effect not simply on just human society. That shows up in a number of different ways. But take a look at the, what happens to the biosphere during the period that human beings are, are available, mm -hmm. are, are, are around. We, we saw already the introduction of fruits across that KT boundary. Now, we had a nice picture of a nice juicy peach, but it's very important to see that the fruits that actually were introduced are not the fruits you would recognize today. The, we'll take a look at this. We're familiar with, and we've had a video on the site covering this, but we'll give a quick summary. We're familiar with corn as a staple of many diets around the world. Mm -hmm. The corn we know today is not the corn that was produced by the biosphere. The corn that was produced by the biosphere, most, nobody, few people alive right now would recognize as corn. It's this little woody thing here called teosinte, where you can't tell, it looks like just a little stalk of mm. sort of like straw or something like that. What it is is about I think maybe 10, 12 of those corn kernels, each one encased in a hard shell. So each one individually is a hard shell you'd crack. Inside of it, you'd find some kind of a meat. They grow all over these little bushy plants. You get these little things, mostly stalk, mostly bush. They grow all over, a little hard shell. Very little available nutrients in that, in that process that required mm -hmm. lots of work to be able to turn into something usable. Human activity acting on that corn over, over the entire course of human development transformed it from this little woody thing to this sort of, you know, still modest by our modern standards, but a huge breakthrough from in terms of nutrition, mm -hmm. tiny little uh, pseudo corn element here where you've at least got the fruit is available to over, and again, just cultivation, cultivation, conscious, willful development into this thing, which is, again, what we recognize first, you know, large, nutritious, now the majority of the plant, if you compare how much of this, your, uh, your actual corn stalk is fruit to how much of your fruit was fruit in the teosinte, the overall energy density of available energy density has increased. Mm -hmm. As you increase the ratio of, of fruit to, to stalk, you increase, what you're increasing here is the available energy density of the biosphere as a whole. Mm -hmm. Now this is one example. You could do the same thing for corn, tomatoes, you know, mm -hmm. bananas, apples. Take a look at any of these, the sort of the original wild version of these. They all look like berries, often berries with hard shells. We transform them into something that's, we've increased the overall throughput of the biosphere. And you can do the same thing when you look at things like land area usage. If you take a look at how much land area, fruit per land area was possible with teosinte compared to what's possible with, the, with corn, huge transformation, huge shift. Uh, same thing with domestic animals. Take a look at the transformation of, of, of cows, pigs, et cetera. I mean, as some of us recently had the experience of eating the, uh, the wild deer. And you notice there's a very distinct problem with the, uh, the uh, fat to muscle to bone ratio in the wild animals versus a good domesticated cow like we've also got around, our, around ourselves here. That we've managed the actual, the actual overall energy density of the, of the cow itself of the animal itself has increased on, uh, as, uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the basis of human activity. Mm -hmm. And you'd point out the biosphere was tending in that direction earlier. If you take a look at your, your, um, uh, uh, you know, your shift in different types of seafood, the amount of meat that's contained in our mollusks is way above what you had in, uh, in uh, right. the, your brachiopods. Prior, the brachiopods. Yeah. So but that overall development, now that is mirrored by... And that constitutes your baseline. That's just what the system's doing. Exactly. Right. That's what, which is a conscious, well, now it's a consciously driven baseline. Right. Exactly. You're consciously so you upgrading. You saw those shifts. The only, the only way you saw those shifts with the evolution of life was by an actual physiological change. Mm -hmm. You actually had a physiological change of the structure of the living organism to correspond to this whole total upshift of the system. Mm -hmm. And mankind, not only do you see it at an incredibly faster rate, like you're saying, it's, it's, it's purely a power of the mind, the human mind, to actually create these new states, yes. create these changes. Consciously, consciously. Right. And it's a continuous process. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be punctuated by collapse, but it can be punctuated by collapse. At any time, you can, like you said earlier, 
any time that we shift to the animal model, that biospheric model, mm -hmm. you're imperial guaranteeing yeah. the imperial model, mm -hmm. which is exactly that, explicitly that, from mm -hmm. the Greens, explicitly that, from uh, you know Gingrich, from the so-called conservative revolution types, mm -hmm. explicitly that, from the liberals and who are endorsing the Greens, explicitly that, explicitly mm -hmm. a return to an animal model of evolution that is ne uh, by necessity punctuated by, by major collapses of systems from which you're not guaranteed to recover, from which you can only recover by, by rebuilding back on that earlier, on that earlier line that they, that they denied. Mm -hmm. But humans have the potential to have this sort of continuous development. Well, uh, you refer to in, in papers as the potential to be an immortal species. Yeah. That exists. <clears throat> We've seen it expressed here in the shift to the different types of, of reliance. What is your, your baseline energy usage as far as power production? We're discussing here, take a look at if you compare the orders of magnitude of energy that you can get from wood burning to coal burning to coke to thermonuclear fission to thermonuclear fusion to matter antimatter reactions. Each time you've got an increase in orders of magnitude, not just multiples of power, but actually orders of magnitude of power mm -hmm. is of increase, which each one of those which can happen within the lifetime of a single human individual, each one of those is on the order of magnitude of the kind of shift that we saw earlier in the biosphere over, only when you have a total shift in the, in the whole system. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that kind of transformation will never cover the lifetime of a single organism. No, 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 no animal can encompass that kind of a shift. They live within it. They're governed by it. But human activity now mm. governs that shift. We encompass it. We actually drive that. And... You got. There is no reason that within the lifetime of a single human individual, you couldn't see three, four, five, any number of those shifts based on the actual willful human creativity and the ability of human society to transform itself. And so this is you now we're going to. We'll be launching a few more studies applying this to to some some key economic policy directions. We've applied it recently to the discussion of the of Arctic development. We'll be applying it more in detail. We're going to be applying it more explicitly to the extraterrestrial imperative. Mm -hmm. um, but quickly, just to end, I'd like to take a look at something that we only hinted at, which is that when you take a look at the overall development of the biosphere here, and you see these, again, those punctuated collapses, you see an arc that's sort of slight, that seems to approximate what should be the human development also. You see this hyperbolic arc. Something is underlying that process that's driving it that's not to be found within any element of that process itself. There's no, as you said, that you can find all sorts of efficient cause relationships between the elements. Mm -hmm. You won't find the actual, the full cause of the process within any of those, those elements. Mm -hmm. Certainly not the fact, and this is really reflected in the fact of what seems to be the these sort of the time reversal, the anticipation in time of a state that's yet to be, mm -hmm. of a state that's necessary. Now we've covered on the site before the fact that you see those punctuated, those period, those extinction events in the biosphere are connected to these, we'll take a look at the galactic cycles image here, are connected to phenomena that are on a much, much larger scale. Now this is on the scale of the galaxy as a whole. You start to see that you begin, you see that the, the exact same cyclical behavior, to the extent that it's a cycle, that you find punctuated and expressed in the form of our galactic motion. Now we've had this covered in more detail, so I won't spend a long time on it here, but just to give you an idea of where you're seeing the echo of the larger causality, but then also where you see man has to go and man's own activity in order to become the actual the actual controller of that of that process. Mm -hmm. For man to actually take control of mankind's own destiny, truly take control of mankind's own destiny, it requires an expansion to this scale of activity, this scale of conscious activity. No longer just governed by this, but consciously acting on this level. This is what we're talking about with policy. And this has to be, that cone of development it begins here and branches out. That level of development has to govern policy making now. This is not something you can wait for and you can get up to allow things to develop. That has to govern policy now. Mm -hmm. and we can discuss it. That requires some very key steps that must be taken here in the present. Uh, and again, like, once you look at this entire process, the steps are explicitly defined. They're not matters of opinion. Mm -hmm. They're not things you could choose to do. 
they're, they're, are, it's, they're not matters of political inclination. It's not what you, what you agree with politically here or there. These are, the, these are the steps that are necessary to maintain our survival. And they express themselves as policy. They express themselves in your vote, in, in what, you, what you do at the ballot box, what you do with your day-to-day -day activity. They're expressed there. They're not matters of your own individual opinion. And so we'll, do, we'll discuss that more here, but I think that sort of gives us a, a backdrop against which to discuss some of these things. Mm -hmm. What you've got in this thing, you've got certain constants. The interesting thing for me was what we pulled together, what you pulled together in this discussion was that there are certain constants in this process. They're mm -hmm. not constants in the sense of a simple parameter, a single parameter, mm -hmm. but they're constants in terms of there's a minimal condition at which there must be a rate of expansion mm -hmm. of development. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you've got to collapse. Mm -hmm. Then you get a point where you have part of the system is expanding, but its expansion is, is limited by its carrying a dr as a drag on it an obsolete what has become an obsolete right. system. Hmm. Therefore, it has to purge itself of the obsolete system in order to grow. Mm -hmm. But there is, in this process, you get a, a constant value, right. which is not a, it's not a ratio as such, mm -hmm. but it's a constant value, which is the system requires that you grow at a certain rate, otherwise mm -hmm. you go extinct. Mm -hmm. And the system requires that you purge yourself of things mm -hmm. which are a burden on things which are far beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, so that they, these critical values actually exist. They're not defined in simple parameters, uh, uh, linear parameters, mm -hmm. right. but they they exist, right. yeah. and that's the concept. Mm -hmm. and then you think about social systems, because when you're dealing with humanity, you're dealing with social systems. Mm -hmm. It's voluntary, and the voluntary behavior of mankind becomes extremely interesting here because the voluntary behavior of mankind is governed by certain rules. Mm -hmm. So it's not wildly voluntary. Hmm. The, the, or, right. the, the options of the maximum you can achieve. We'll take, for example, let's take the case of uh, simple explosives or fire and so forth in different forms. And the difference of mankind, the only animal that uses fire voluntarily is man. No other species ever living was capable of voluntarily using fire. Mm -hmm. And without the use of fire, mankind as a species would never have developed. Mm -hmm. hmm? So that therefore there are you find that these this thing is so co consistent, so remarkably consistent mm. you know, in terms of the guiding principle, the governing principles. Yes. Mm -hmm. And everything that happens is follows these governing principles. Right. And the key here is we've we've got now to this level of we've broken through in a sense unofficially. We're now used going beyond fire. Mankind is defined by fire. Without fire, mankind is not man. Mm -hmm. right? Right. But then we've used various types of fire, as fire, simply as combustion. Now we've come to something which is not simply combustion, it's, it's synthesis. Right. Um, right. Okay. Fission is synthesis. Mm -hmm. Fusion is synthesis. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Matter, antimatter is synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, so now we, we've got, we've got, we've solved the, we do the same thing that the early species did. We yeah. consume and eliminate something that is used up. Right. It's used up its function mm -hmm. for, for mankind. Mm -hmm. But the, what it is continuing is you get beyond that point, and it still goes on, but you don't notice it, because now it, when you get to matter antimatter reaction or the prospect of it, and this, that, this huge of hydrogen, you're taking hydrogen and you're uh -huh. splitting it first for, for thermal fusion. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to a higher layer of this splitting it, mm -hmm. which is a matter antimatter reaction. Mm -hmm. And we're not, we took, take the orders of magnitude you had here in your, in your chart. Right. Yeah. The orders, that order, those orders of magnitude and the changes in orders of magnitude indicate what man is. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And the idiot who doesn't understand that mm -hmm. is about to go extinct. Mm -hmm. Because you, this is not merely, look, we're going into, into Mars, right? We're going to land on Mars. We're going to develop the, we have to. It's not because there was a shortage of materials or because we're trying to loot something. It's because man requires a, an advantage in terms of taking over the solar system. Mm -hmm. you know, man must take over the solar system. Mm -hmm. And he, at the time he's taking over the solar system, he's already invading the galaxy. Yeah. You know, we think of the galaxy as eating up mankind. Mm -hmm. But actually, mankind is beginning to eat up the galaxy. 
And the crab nebula is a fascinating creature because of its recent vintage, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely different kind of process than we find recorded in the record of the, of the galaxy before mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So we have, it's a continuous process. And, but what we have to do, we have to take over Mars because that, it's available. Right. It's the only thing we can start with. But we're not going to leave it like Mars. We're going to change it. We're going mm -hmm. to change Mars because we're going to have to create a... a basis of sustenance for humanity, which fits our requirements. Mm -hmm. we, can, we also are capable of creating artificial environments for ourselves right. mm -hmm. in, on a planet. And we don't, don't really go directly out of doors, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of thing. So right. there's, there's a constant trend in this process. Mm -hmm. And, and what everything is always done that. This is not some kind of new, completely wild thing. This is not unnatural. This is what... This is development. Mm -hmm. The time when we went to fission and went beyond fission to fusion, mm -hmm. we broke the limits of the bounds of a solar system right. inherently. Mankind will not exist now mm. unless we go to thermonuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. right. And thermonuclear fusion is this one gravity factor for going to Mars. It, it's there, it's feasible now, it's not feasible in terms of we don't have the manufacturing capabilities and so forth to right. do this right away. But the concept of doing it exists for us as a feasible concept right now. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, we have indications on the characteristics of hydrogen in advanced form of use, mm -hmm. huh? which leads us into the question of matter and matter reactions. Right, yeah. that, that trajectory is defined. Exactly. The necessary, necessary trajectory is already there. Whether we're on it or not, that's defined. Exactly. Therefore, mm -hmm. the... Now, the other side is what is wrong with mankind's minds? Mm -hmm. If this is the, if this what we have here, which is true, obviously, huh? mm -hmm. that if this is true, then what mankind has generally defined as the policy for mankind has been idiocy. Mm -hmm. Always we have to make these leaps which go with these orders of magnitude from mm -hmm. man's early use of fire and then things beyond on that. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to the point that a planet can no longer contain us, right. uh, mm -hmm. essentially. And when we move to Mars, we are going to go from the way of the moon. We're going to have to tunnel, use the tunnels in the moon. We're going to have people up there under protected environments. We're going to have to do something about gravity, anti-gravity effects. Mm -hmm. We can synthesize those. We're going to have to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're already in the position where we have the ability, intrinsically, in terms of concepts, the ability to go to Mars. Yeah. We can do it in terms of one week from, from Earth to Mars. Mm -hmm. And we have that capability now as a scientific capability. And this scientific capability arising at this point defines mankind's immediate destiny. Mm -hmm. Either we go to Mars not to find a place to live, but we're either capable of going into the solar system to the degree of taking over Mars, mm -hmm. that we can exist there, or else we're going to fail as a species. Mm -hmm. And the failure is a collapse. Mm -hmm. It's not simply a failure. People, anybody who argues that there's, again, right. and you made this point, there's any sort of sustainable development now is just completely insane. The sustainable development is riding one of those cones to the extinction point. Right? Well, this is a religious question. Because what we've had, we've, the problem mankind has had is the existence of the oligarchical system. Mm -hmm in which a few people, and this happened, of course, with the Mariner culture. The Mariner culture was way beyond, in its terms of its culture, any culture on land-based, mm -hmm. because the, it developed on the basis of tr transoceanic travel. Okay. Um, so you had a, a group of people which was divided into two factions. One faction was, became the oligarchical faction as such, mm -hmm. and the other faction was, a, was the opposition to the oligarchical faction from among the Mariners. Okay which is the main the old story of... of, 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 of you, yeah. you know. mm -hmm. So, therefore, mm -hmm. we, we come to the point now that mankind has, re mankind has reached the limits of staying on Earth, not because of a shortage of places to live, but because we have to extend mankind's influence by forcing ourselves to go to an order of magnitude of right. power, mm -hmm. which requires us to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not going to Mars because Mars needs us. Mm -hmm. We're going to Mars because we need to take over Mars mm -hmm. as they step a leap from being confined to Earth. Mm -hmm. 
And when we think about all these things that are threatening people, like these big rocks that are threatening to come through the earth right, and yeah, destroy right. everybody, mm -hmm. that's a good explanation of why we need to do that. Right. And mm -hmm. that there's no option to just deal with problems here, as people want to argue. Well, you also, such problems here. Well, we have the influence of the oligarchical mentality mm -hmm. imposed upon people on this planet. Mm -hmm. They think in terms of what they're forced to do by being pushed by a shortage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They they also want to maintain their power, therefore they kill people who become excessively numerous in their opinion, mm -hmm. which is what's been going on. But the reason is we, we are forced to go to eliminate the risk of the human species being wiped out right. by going to Mars. We have to go there for that reason. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go beyond that. This is indicated by the fact we now have thermonuclear fusion as a tool which we have been suppressing in a large degree, except for military and civil purposes. But if we use it for its proper purpose, we can go from Earth to Mars essentially in a week at, at, at thermonuclear fusion rates. And we can go beyond that. What we're doing now beyond that it gives us the, we begin to break the limits on the galaxy. We enter the galaxy as such, as, it, as a part of the galaxy. With, the th with beyond, going beyond that, the yeah. matter random matter reaction, the hydrogen yeah. reaction. Thing. It puts Mars closer than the New World was in the, at the time of the founding of the New World. Uh -huh. Exactly. <laughs> so therefore, this is man's natural destiny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are a creative species, except most people in this society are not creative. Mm -hmm. They've been told not to be. And you have people who are uh, trained to accept be victims of the oligarchy, and they will kill people for the oligarchy for the sake of the oligarchy. They will kill their own species in order to please these so-called gods, mm -hmm. <laughs> the oligarchs, the imperialists, the imperial system. And the whole planet of the, today is dominated by a British empire. Mm -hmm. There is no Britain. There's a British empire which is not confined or in any sense to the United Kingdom. Right. It, it is a global system mm -hmm. which has extended its power in every part of the globe it can reach. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the empire. That means a very small group of people is deciding to re maintain this religious cult. Uh, mm -hmm. And they conditioned the slaves to learn to be obedient slaves. And anybody who believes in the green thing is insane, mm -hmm. and they're also a degraded slave, mm -hmm. the worst, lowest kind of slave. Huh? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this, uh, these are the lessons that have to be adduced from this kind of right. material. And it's so clear. I mean, the record there is so absolutely clear. I mean, we'll lay it out in more and more detail, but there's not a question about it. As you said, this is a matter of, it is a matter of religious belief and a matter of policy that's imposed from the top. It has nothing to do with scientific fact, any of the green program, any of this. Well, what we got here, which, what this has done today, what is, well, it's a, it's a rough draft of the real situation. Mm -hmm. It itself is a concept. It represents a concept which people need to know. And it's the kind of concept that can help them liberate themselves from this slave mentality mm -hmm. of, of believing in the green, the green yeah. philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The greenies are going to kill humanity. They're going to destroy humanity. They're the enemies of humanity. Mm -hmm. huh? And we have to get beyond that, and that means we're, we're going to Mars. And we, we have the potential science to know how to get to Mars, not the engineering aspects of it as such. But we can, within a short period of time, relative to our human lifespan, mm -hmm. we, can, we, are, we can reach that. Right. We can reach Mars and, and assimilate it. We can also, it, we, to reach Mars means that we will be able to deploy from Mars to defend Earth. Because we've got all these nasty rocks mm -hmm. coming down mm -hmm. from within the orbit of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and those nasty pieces of rock, if one of them ever hits Earth, one of the big ones, direct on, the human species is extinct. Right. If we don't go to Mars, humanity will go extinct when one of these rocks hits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we now have Pres President Obama is trying to destroy any attempt to interfere with those rocks mm -hmm. from smashing up the planet mm -hmm. Earth. Mm -hmm. And anybody who supports Obama has to be really nuts. Mm -hmm. And again, you see this sort of, that, that that's the suicidal instinct of empire, the homicidal and suicidal at once. Exactly. Which mm -hmm. is that they've got no way to maintain, the very act of trying to maintain the system stable will destroy the system and destroy them. The, it's, mm -hmm. the point is the difference between, say, Obama and the British today. Mm -hmm. Obama is a British puppet. 
He's a British puppet made in the mold of the, you know, the ancient empire, of the imperial system. But there's a difference between Obama, who's the toy, and the British. Obama is a useless creature. He has no function whatsoever, except mm -hmm. he's used by the oligarchy. But on the British side, you've got a different situation. Obama doesn't care. He's a nut. He's insane. So he's acting as an insane man, and his insanity is being used by the British for a purpose. But the British are a different proposition. Mm -hmm. That is the British monarchy and the people in it. They actually int have an idea that they're going to rule this planet or nobody is going to. So therefore, the queen has a completely different mentality than her puppet, Obama. She controls him, but she, has, she doesn't like him. She despises him. He's a piece of trash as far as she's concerned. What she's saying, we, the British monarchy, who are the empire emperors of the world right now, in her opinion, we are going to either control this planet our way, mm -hmm. according to our interests, or let the planet go to hell. Mm -hmm. Because if you, take, if you take us out of power over this planet, we have to kill you. Mm -hmm. Because that means, if, because if you kill, take our power away, you're killing us. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we'll use every weapon. And that's, when you think about the plan for thermonuclear warfare against Asia, which is now the current policy which this president is being pushed into. Mm -hmm. he, I don't think he has the brains to know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the British, the monarchy does. The queen is, knows exactly what this is. And the aim is they're going to destroy the population, kill off most of the population, as the queen has said right. in the transatlantic region. But they're not going to let Asia be left alone Mm -hmm. while they're wiping out the transatlantic region mm -hmm. or cutting down the population today by, you know, one, by 11% or something, two down to 11%. So therefore, their point is they are going to use thermonuclear weapons to destroy Asia now right. as the only hope of their ability to control the planet mm -hmm. as an empire. And therefore, apart from all the fools, who say, don't exaggerate, don't exaggerate. I'm not exaggerating at all. They're exaggerating mm -hmm. by denial. They're exaggerating when there's not going to be any food on the table and say, we've got to support this president mm -hmm. who's killing the food supply of the American people. They're nuts. Right. And you can, the thing is, it's the level of the causality because it's not, it's not, this is where you people play games of trying to figure out, well, what connecto is going to happen? Are the right connectos there to, are there the right connectos for war right now? Are there the mm -hmm. right connectos for collapse? It's not that. It's that the, there's, this is like the what we call before the appointment in Samara. There's no way around as long as you as long as the intention is to try and prevent the system from prevent the human development from doing what it must do next. If you try to prevent that trajectory and hold it still, you are inevitably going to see the collapse in whatever form. The you know even on the level of cultural collapse. On one level, the cultural collapse causes where we're at right now. But on another level, if you want to try and stop that kind of development, if you want to stop the human destiny to move towards Mars and Mars' development, you have to destroy people's morale and culture and morality to do that. The only way to get a society that will accept that is to destroy them culturally. The other thing is, if the British were to win, they would destroy themselves immediately. Mm -hmm. Because what, by destroying the ability to do what mankind has become able to do with, with technology and culture, so far. If the British destroy that in themselves, mm -hmm. they won't be able to rebuild. Right. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the British will, go, will die. But I think the British, in a sense, the monarchy, the British monarchy would accept its own extermination rather than see, uh, seeing us live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the same thing is, in a sense, true as it was of Nero, mm -hmm. which is also potentially true of the president. Nero, when he was faced with defeat, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that Obama will do the same thing, which is why I've emphasized that this guy's got to be protected because we do not want the right. burden of having this guy kill himself, right. commit suicide. No, and it's a real risk. This is the difference between the human sense of identity and the animal sense of identity. But the animal, when a principle dies in the biosphere, the animals die with it. Yeah. When, you, when it's time for a new principle, all the organisms that manifest it go. When a principle dies in the noosphere, in human activity, human beings don't have to go with it. 
but the debased human, the debased human who identifies with that, with that dying principle, in that case, you do die with it. That's right. And in their own imagination, they die with it. They can't see their own, they can't imagine their own immortality. They can't imagine their own personal survival beyond the death of that principle. They have something inside them which will not let them go. And that thing which they have cultivated in themselves from generation to generation will destroy them under these circumstances. They have no, they have no chance of survival. Therefore, we have a mission. We have to cause the survival of humanity against those enemies of humanity, which include the British monarchy and the damn fools who follow them. The greenies. This is a, there are people who are programmed to destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. Just think about with the food supply. Think about the food supply this spring. <coughs> if we don't do something to change the direction of this, we're going to have a shortage of food, which will cause mass death inside the United States, among other places. So we're in that kind of a situation. We're in that kind of mentality. That those who are the greenies will destroy themselves. Not because they understand what they're doing, but they will do it out of religious fervor. Mm. They're programmed with that. They're, yeah, they're actually programmed. They're brainwashed. A greenie is, by definition, brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Because it does not correspond, his behavior does not correspond to anything which is corresponds to a human interest. No, yeah. Therefore, he's become dehumanized, and that's what makes him a greenie. So they react instinctively against anything human, and they'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. The idea that anything, oh, human progress, immediately. Well, that's mm -hmm. what the British have produced. Mm -hmm. It was the British that produced it, this form. You had the earlier form, for example, the, the ancient Mediterranean form, mm. where the, the old empires of the Mediterranean base would just kill off a whole part of the population from time to time because they didn't want them to become right. too numerous and therefore become a challenge. So they would just chop off the heads, mm -hmm. in effect, of whole parts of the population in order to control it. Mm -hmm. The British are doing that on a grand scale now. Right. That's what the Green Movement is. And remember how it was started. It started in this form right? Right. in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. it, st and it started with the, you know, the little war there, the Seven Years' War. That's when it started. And we're back, it's now just gone to a more advanced stage. And if people don't have got the brains to recognize that, they're going to be extinct. That's the danger to humanity, the danger of a human extinction. And the source of the extinction threat to humanity lies in the British monarchy. Because it's not the monarchy in some childish sense. It's a monarchy that they think in terms of history. They think of themselves as the legacy of the oligarchy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to live any other way. It's mm -hmm. not a particular thing. Mm -hmm. It's the ability, the power, the d discretion to be able to control the process, which mm -hmm. defines them as an oligarchy. It's a sense of identity. Right. Mm -hmm. Which way, as long as that exists, there's a threat. There's no way to just live with that. There's no way to say, oh, they're behaving now. Yeah. There's no way to say they're not doing something evil right at this moment. As long as they exist, that's a threat. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do is you say, well, the way we get past that threshold, that shift, you have to guarantee the extinction of their ideology. If they, if they decide to go with it, which in very likelihood they will, then that has to be the, the way, that has to be the way things unfold. But the ideology has to go. There has to be an extinction event and a speciation event in that sense. And either the extinction of the oligarchy or the extinction of mankind. That's what we are. Mm -hmm. They just have to learn to get a lot, learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. mm. Let them raise rabbits. <laughs> I'm trying to control that. Yeah. Well, I think that's that's pretty clear. Anyone else have anything to say before we close out? On our hand, we'll have no. I mean, we'll put, we'll have this in a more condensed form of a report soon in the next days. But that's that's all we can anticipate. That we're going to try and get that spread out far and wide along with the associated economic analyses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for this week. Uh, with this material, you have everything you need to know to save yourself. So let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>